I will be speaking on iliosacral screws indications. The indications for all iliosacral screws is an unstable sacroiliac joint complex like an opening of the SI joint or a displaced and disimpacted sacral fractures. In fact, any of the case which you want to fix for the posterior pelvis, iliosacral screw is a very good option which can be used and can be used by anyone anywhere in the country. Why do we use them? Because it's a minimally invasive, it gives us less comorbidities, less blood loss is there, wound healing problems are less. And once you are okay with that and understand what's how it is to be done, you will have a very less operative time and providing adequate and very great fixation. When to use it? As Sunil had shown in resuscitation screw in emergencies where you can use them, or you can also use them as a definitive fixation for a definitive fixation of the pelvis and the posterior side. Coming to the screw positions, remember that we are dealing with two fracture types. One is the SI joint dislocations and one is the sacrum. So we want to ensure that our screws are going as perpendicular to the fracture or to the joint as possible to get a complete compression and not giving us a shear effect. So the screws will be different and position of them will be different. So let's keeping that in mind, we see that in this fashion, if the SI joint dislocation was there, we have put in two screws from the left side and in the sacral fractures, what we see, we are trying to be as perpendicular to the fracture to give compression. And in the outlet views, we can see that we have put these screws in the S1 in one side on the SI joint and S2 on the opposite side, which shows us that correct screw direction for a specific and individual fracture pattern is very much important. And that's how you can ensure that you're getting good stability. Then let's come to what is common. Most important thing is pre-op evaluation with a CT scan. People might say that we look everything on an X-ray we can see, but remember that in a normal X-ray and in a normal CT scan and in a normal pelvis, you have an osseous corridor, which is roughly 1.5 to roughly two, two centimeters thick in the S1 region where you can put in the screws. But remember that there is a sacral dysmorphism, which is common, very common, especially in our country, as well as in all the other countries as well, where the osseous corridor can be very small, less than 10 millimeters. And here you might have to put in a screw which has angle will change and the corridor will be very small. So always get a CT scan to get and be sure that there is no dysplasias. Uh, the study by, I think by Chip Rout could show that there were nearly 50% cases where the CT of the pelvis and the posterior side was not as what you wanted for the screws to be put in. Now we come to what are the structures at risk. Remember, you are going into from bone to bone in here. So you have the ureter and the L5 nerve roots which are going on the sacral ala. You have the sacral canal on the posterior side. You have the common iliac arteries on the front which are bifurcating into the external and the internal iliacs and the ureters just going adjacent to them. So you have to ensure that your screws are going just into that promontory area or into the bone remaining there and not going into these vital structures, which if are damaged can have catastrophic results. Besides this, you also have all these nerves and the vessels which are there. So we need to ensure that these are the structures which we will have to be ensuring that they are not getting damaged and we put the screw right at the place. That brings us to what and how the proper surgical technique to be used here. The most important thing is you can do it in both supine and prone positions drape freely the entire abdomen as well as because you might have to go open also if you want and the involved leg where you want to do the distractions and reductions. Radi Radiolucent table is preferable here. Always and always before draping, see that you can get your outlet view properly as well as the lateral view. Many a times it will happen that you just scrub in, get in and when you want to get the outlet view, your base of your OT table is going to be hindering and you just cannot get the outlet view. So get them done before and always use a very good image intensifier, preferably with nine inches diameter and beyond that, which is around 12 inches, that is going to help. When we do it in a supine position, what we try to do is keep the pelvis and the body elevated because it's not on the table. We keep it around six inches more elevated because if you're putting in an SI joint screw, which here your screw direction has to be from posterior to anterior, there your drill machine is going to be touching and obstructing the OT table. So ensure that your screws and your table and the pelvis is higher around four to six inches so that you can get the proper trajectory which you want 
for putting in the iliosacral screw. Coming to the radiology, this is where you want, you want the sciatic notches to be perfectly lateral along with the iliac cortical density, which are nothing but the SI joint where the overlapping of the sacral ala, uh, the cortical bone as well as the iliac bone is happening. Entry point has to be inferior to the iliac cortical density. So I'm giving you this representation. This is your iliac cortical density, which is the sacral ala and the SI joint. And you can see that in all the three pictorial graphs. That prominence of the triangle is your sacral promontory. This is the posterior part of your sacral, anterior canal rather. This is your anterior sacrum. And that one is your S1, S2 disc space. So you see that your screw entry point has to be below the ICD in the center, preferably slightly on the more posterior aspect going into the anterior part. Once you are able to ensure that in a lateral view, then you go in for an outlet view and try to see that you are going above the S1 neural foramina. That's the foramina and your screw is going or the drill is going as an eyebrow or the eyelashes or eyebrow to the eye of the neural foramina. Then you look at the inlet view, see whether your inlet view, you are inside the sacrum and not going anterior to it or posterior into the sacral canal and thus preventing any damage to the vital organs. Then you further this drill guide right up to the opposite side. And then you can put in your screw into this place. We'll discuss the partially or the cannulated screws. In the S2, if you want to put the screws, the same thing is there. You get a perfect lateral, get the guide wire right in the center of it, get a bullseye so that you are able to get the proper planes of that. And then you again put your S2 screw with a drill guide, ensuring that your neural foraminas are separate and it is going between the S1 and S2 neural foramina, both in S1 as well as in, uh, in the inlet and the outlet views. Finally, if you are looking after putting in the screws, you should have two bullseyes as such, the screws going right in between the S1 and the S2 and in the outlet views where you can see that they are going and not if you want, you can put them transiliac or transsacral, or else you can put them in whichever place you want. And that's his post-op images. As I said, they can, there are screws which you can convert and put them into transiliac, transsacral screws, which was popularized 10 years back. And this is the same trajectory and the same things which you do. You just continue further and ensure, like in the third image, you can see that our drill bit on the S2 is going right beyond the opposite side of ilium and you are able to put in the screw, which is transceliac, transsacral screw, getting a complete hold from one ileum to the other, going through the sacrum. The only problem with this is that you require a screw length, which is around 150 to 160 millimeters, and which may or may not be available to us, especially in our country, where I, say, I think 130, 140 are the maximum, and then you need to get indigenously developed screws whose strength may be in question when you are putting them and getting them to so much stress loading. How to achieve optimal stability and what are the how many screws are adequate? There are papers both for SI joint dislocations as well as for sacral fractures, which have shown that two sacroiliac screws are a must in an unstable pelvic injuries, where you are doing it for a proper indication of disimpacted and displaced sacral fractures or widely displaced SI joint dislocations. One screw is adequate only for an undisplaced fracture LC1 or LC2, mild LC1, I would say, just an undisplaced sacral fracture where your one screw is just holding that and reducing the pain. But two screws are a must if you are doing it for an unstable pelvic injury. And that you can put either in S1 or in S1 and S2 as the choice may be. Which screws to put? Normally, cannulated screws are put 7.5 to 8 millimeters. Partially threaded are the easily ones which you can get and available. So you can put them in 32 millimeters. Fully threaded screws are usually put for sacral fractures, but there are papers, especially from Alabama in Jason Lowy has shown that even if you put in partially threaded screws in a S2 or a zone two sacral fractures, there is not amount of compression that you can increase the neurological damages to them. This is our own paper where we studied the sacral morphologies and the, was, uh, the safe osseous corridors where we could see that in S2 screws, putting in a 7.3 mm screw with two millimeters of gaps on either side 
was difficult in nearly half of the patients, but in S1 screw, very easily you can put in 7.3 or even 8 mm screws without any problems. A few examples of how do we do this. This is a young patient, BSF soldier who had a widely displaced SI joint with a pubic rami fracture. You could see a mild sacral avulsions also, and the CT scan showed us the ideal indication for going in for an iliosacral screw. He was a very robust, a very high and tall built person where for the fixation part, we were able to get, we got one or two screws, not able to get a complete and good purchase or a compression out there. So we ended up putting in three screws in the sacrum, getting two screws in S1, one in S2, and augmented it with an interior fixation as well by putting in the screw in the pubic rami so that our posterior fixation just alone, not doing it anteriorly will not be hand hampering the stability part. This is his follow-up images after one year where the things have completely united. And you can see that all the things are now united and this patient is able to do all his activities. Just to go about another 28 year old male having an APC two or a three type fracture or dislocations, here, what you see in the CT scan is your dysmorphism. You can see there is a variation in this part of the sacrum where if you are very anterior and try to go into the promontory, you might be going in, out, in of the bone. And that's what you need to prevent and ensure. And that's why CT is very important when you try to get it beforehand. We fix that anteriorly. And since there was a very small corridor in the S1, we put in a small screw obliquely driven as I had shown in the CT scan in the S1 and then a S2 corridor in such dysmorphic sacrums are very big where you can put in the screws. So this is what we did, a small screw where you can see that the corridor is a small one. It is below this, that's the posterior border. And the S2 screw was put long enough to get a good hold on the posterior aspect. And this is how the sacral dysmorphic cases were taken and fixed with iliosacral screws on the back with a small in S1 and a major screw in the S2 screw. And that's his follow-up where you think you can see that the patient is having good stability even after one year. Coming to one or two examples in sacral fractures, as I said, undisplaced sacral fractures are a good way to learn how to put in an iliosacral screw, but the real thing and the real indication for putting in iliosacral screws are in widely displaced fractures where you reduce them and then you can see that it's gone posteriorly as well as vertically higher up. You see them in prone position. I reduce them first by opening up from the backside. You can see that this is how that image had gone. The vertical displacements were there. I reduced it and you can see that now that cortical continuity of the sacrum, ala and the interior part has been maintained. We fix it with K, stabilized it with K wires. And then like a routine thing, you just put in and fire in your screws in S1 and in S2 and get the adequate fixation which you want with the staples showing you the opening as well as a complete reduction of the sacrum which had both anterior, posterior and vertical dimensions and displacements were taken care of. This is another case having a 22 year old lady fall from metro station third floor high and you can see the amount of displacements of the ileum of the inlets as well as both posteriorly and superiorly how the sacrum has got displaced and these were resuscitated first initially. You can see the pelvic bandaging with the towel clips out there initially, where it was done. Then when finally the sacrum and the CTs were done, we could see that it's a comminuted sort of a sacral fracture. Some people, and that might be an indication for some for doing a spinopelvic, but when you can reduce them properly and you can fix them with an opposite side hemipelvis and the hemisacrum, I think with adequate stability, you can get very good fixations, provided that you are giving good fixation on the posterior side of your pelvis with iliosacral screws. And that's what we did, sorry, we reduced. You can see in the first screws, how the posterior sacrum has gone. We reduced it first prone with a shan spin in the AS and the post PSIS, and we could get a complete inlet continuity of the sacrum and the inlet view. Then after reduction in a proper in vertical displacements were reduced, we fired in two screws for the S1 and the S2 part, getting good compression as well as good fixation, maintaining the displacements which had been reduced properly. And finally, the interior fixation was also done. And you can see the corresponding pre-injury and post-injury status with an inlet view and the outlet views and the AP views. 
And this was the view where the inlet view shows you the amount of displacement and how with just this amount of screw fixation and the interior fixation with symphysis, you can get adequate fixation without going into another level up, which might be required if you are not able to get it with iliosacral screws. This is her follow-up after one year, and you can see that everything is maintained and she is now going around happily with this. So I'll end by saying that remember iliosacral screw, you need to understand that you have to have an optimal indication for that, then its use and benefits are immense and it can really, and it has changed the outcomes in posterior pelvic injuries to a great extent, making it available to all the surgeons who can fix it without any major problem morbidities to the patient. Correct screw pathway needs to be understood. Look always for lumbosacral dysplasias and fluoroscopy has to be very nice when you are fixing them. Accurate reduction is paramount. That reduction, if you are not able to get percutaneously by traction, you need to do open as I have shown in my sacral fractures. I open them, get anatomical reduction and then fix them. Safe surgical technique as described is a must so that you avoid damage to the vital organs and it becomes a very less morbid and a great procedure once you master that properly. I thank you for your hearing.